expensive. We can only give them meat once a week. But sometimes, some interested donors will appear and they will have quite lavish meals. Tonight, they are having a vegetable, vegetable dish. <laughs> Most of our graduates, or almost all of our graduates, return to their churches, to their associations, and serve for the rest of their lives. Very few people come here to look for the truth. And um, frankly speaking, we don't have room for those people who come here only to uh, be educated and not to be prepared or equipped for the ministry. Of this school are very hardworking and they are trying their very best wherever they are to serve the Lord and that very few of them abandon the ministry. In 27, this, this school was founded. At that time, there was hardly any college students who came to the seminary. Only some standard pass came here. And so, to keep up with the rising standard of education of the church folks, we had to start this theological education at the higher level. At the time, there were only three students, Muller, John Petit, and Peter Ta. Then in 1929, I came here. I started as a student in the English department, then as a teacher of psychology in the French department, and as associate director of evangelism for our churches in Burma. After three years, I was, uh, I was made to go to the state for further theological education. Yeah, I studied at Andover Newton Theological Seminary in 32 to 33, and then to Northern Baptist Theological Seminary in 33 to 34. I came back here and studied as a teacher in the Crane School and also in the Divinity School. At the same time, I carried on with my duty as Director of Evangelism. The school was started. The classrooms were held in the missionaries' quarters and in the Grand Theological Seminary classrooms. And in 1938, a separate building was put up. It was dedicated in the year 1938 with our regular education until the war broke out in 1941, February. At the time, the student number had swollen to 29 beyond all our expectation. We thought that no educated young men and young women of college education would ever come. But came, they did. And there were 29 at the time. When the Second World War broke out, we all dispersed into our own homes and local area and we took care of the local churches. And then in 1948, our missionaries again asked me to organize the reopening of the Divinity School. At first, I was named chairman of the curriculum committee. I had to take care of the classrooms and the equipment, provided everything, and then I was given an allowance of 2,000 charts to start the school. I came back here, I took charge, and then I recruited missionaries who have come back, even from Judson College, 
there were Miss Hunt, Miss Bibi, Miss Cummin, and also from uh, Fred Johnson County from the English department. The school was at the time uh, without a proper head. I was only the chairman of the curriculum committee. And then in 1952, a special missionary, Dr. Paul D. Clasper, was sent here to be serving on the seminary hill for the Divinity School. And there, when he arrived, the question arose, what designation we would give him? I said, he should be the president of the Burma Divinity School. But all the missionaries said that this is time of change. The national must head up the school. I said, I am already heading up the Grand Theological Seminary. But then they insisted on my heading up the school. And so only in 1952, I was named the president of the school. Then I was serving two schools at the same time. And then I get into understanding with Dr. Clasper, who was then designated vice president of the school. And we had a complete understanding between Dr. Clasper and me. And I said, Dr. Clasper would be the minister for foreign affair, and I would take charge of the home affair. Because I'm a national, I know the people of my land, and Dr. Clasper was from another land, and he knows the people of the then who sent us missionaries. And so we carry on from there until 1977, at the age of 72, I retired. At that time, we thought that the seminary could develop only up to 100 students. I remember the time when Prasawat and I tried to plan the future for the school and we thought that the seminary, which started with only four students, could gather up as many as only 100 students. And we put the ceiling at 40 girls and 60 men. But then, in 1965, when the missionaries had to retire and leave the land, to our surprise, there were more than 100 students already. And now, in the year 1991, there are more than 200 students. It was unexpected, and it was beyond anything that we dared dream. We hope that from our school will go out future leaders of our churches in this land of ours. In 1977, Ramu Estelwin took over as the officiating president of the school. Then, Fra Victor Sanlo took over as the president. And then, in 1987, my daughter, Noewa, the present president, took over as the president. And I want to thank all our missionaries, past and present, and I hope future too, for their selfless services and for their unstinting offer of themselves to the service of the churches general in Burma and to the divinity school in particular. Hello, my name is Arlet Ma, the daughter of Dr. Ewa, who's been telling you about Myanmar Institute of Theology. I would like to share with you some of her dreams about MIT. Last year, over 300 students applied for MIT seeking to train for full-time Christian service, but only a hundred could be accepted and many of them were disappointed. MIT now would like to expand its building in order to accept more students. Our dreams include two faculty duplexes that would then free up the space in the existing buildings for more students. It's a call for good quality, long-lasting building made of 
reinforced concrete and brick, and the approximate cost is $25,000 each. I'd also like to have a chapel hall where all the 300 students could meet together for worship and programs together. Right now, the largest building can hold only about 60 students and the probable cost is $75,000. Increasing the size of school means we would need to have another main building of at least 100 feet by 50 feet for classes, administrations, and dormitories. And that would also cost for $75,000. Other expenses such as draining another well as our one well is now inadequate and increasing the electric supply. During World War II, our buildings were used by Japanese as their headquarters and they dug trenches, tunnels and bunkers around them for protection. And this has caused the building to settle and my mother will tell you about the cracking problems. Of the most serious problems that we have to face is the maintenance and repairs of our buildings. We are now standing in a room which is part of the old library building. Now this part has been converted to an apartment for a faculty member. The cracks appeared many years ago, but they just filled up the cracks and the cracks got wider and worse. So three years ago, we had this part of the building properly repaired. And we thought that everything was going to work out fine until this summer, 1991 summer, when we had two earthquakes and the cracks appeared again. So now, we are trying to consider what is the best way to uh, go about it. Probably we shall have to tear this part of the building down and then we build a new one. You can see our existing buildings need extensive repair. It takes many, but most of our people have very little of it. Most of our Burmese people generously support the school, but most of them make $150 a year and many of them $10 a month. My mother, who is a full-time president and teacher at MIT, make $11 a month. While we have been able to raise enough money to cover the current expenses, we are dependent upon the generosity of our fellow Baptists in America for our capital improvements.